turn uh, for a start. Uh, you know, the, the title of any presentation uh, opens up a window uh, to the mind of the, the presenter. Now, when you look at the title, here's something that you ought to take note of. Number one, you will see that I am talking about only one tenth of the whole. Now, I know in, in our Adventist language uh, and lingo, uh, very often we talk about tithes within the church. That is not correct. Unless, of course, we are practicing a second tithe and a third tithe. But insofar as the denomination is concerned globally, we are talking specifically about just one tenth. That's why it is theologically correct to talk tithe in the singular rather than tithes. Second thing I want you to know in the title is the emphasis on love. From God's perspective, tithe is a demonstration of God's care for us. And I think that's a very powerful motivation. It's, it's about love, but this is God's love uh, towards us. Again, I make the point that right across, across the globe, as far as the world church is concerned, the things that we're sharing with you here are standard. It's, it's basic. And so there's nothing strange uh, or perhaps out of the church that we're talking about. It's all within the church. But I am putting the spotlight on some areas that perhaps we have neglected uh, in the past. The question is very often asked, why is stewardship so important to us? Now I want you to know that as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as a pastor, I am passionate and I am very committed uh, to stewardship. And that's because stewardship is more than a department of the church. It's more than a program of the church. In fact, stewardship is about who we are as a Seventh-day Adventist. It's part of our identity. Now to make the point, let me quickly take you or give you an overview of our basic fundamentals or part of it as a Seventh-day Adventist. Now I shared this this morning with the church uh, where I was preaching, but, but it's also important for you because it provides a foundation for the things that we'll talk about uh, in, in a moment. Now, when you look at these fundamentals, I want you to know that certain things are primary. Certain things must come first before other things in our foundation of theological beliefs. For example, Scripture, which you see uh, on the top, comes before spiritual gifts. Are spiritual gifts important? Absolutely. But I'm saying that the Word of God is more important. Now you can move down to the uh, next uh, level. Alan White, by the way, is very important. It's part of what we call the spirit of prophecy teaching of the church. And yes, Alan White lived in Australia. In fact, Alan White received a vision specifically for the establishment of Avondale College. In fact, she was shown in a vision, a, a piece of land, and she actually went to that piece of land and, and, and started to dig it up. And that's where Avondale College is located. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ comes before Ellen White. Now I know uh, in, in the way we express our faith, uh, sometimes we'd like to quote Ellen White, and that's good. But I'd like to remind you that before Ellen White there was Christ. And, and, and the way we approach the Christian life and theology starts with Scripture, starts with Christ before we move to Ellen White. Why don't you go down to the bottom? Look at salvation, the relationship of salvation and stewardship. In the sermon that I took this morning, based on Luke chapter 19, I make the case that before stewardship, salvation must come first. And so I want to use that as the framework for understanding tithe and offerings. 
You cannot, let me talk to you as stewardship educators, whether you're a pastor, an elder, or a departmental person, you cannot talk about the specifics of stewardship in the absence of talking to people about Jesus as the Savior. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Salvation comes first, but it is a fact that when we are saved, then the Spirit will work in our life. The Spirit will transform us, and stewardship is part of those things that will take place as we decide to follow Christ. Now, you don't need to try and, and, and write this down, but this is how the 21st fundamental of the church uh, is written out. So we have 28 fundamentals. Stewardship is fundamental 21. Now, if I have the time, I will illustrate and I'll underline some key parts uh, to this fundamental. But already as a church, we are saying that stewardship is bigger than tithe and offerings. Some of you who have been following me talking about stewardship, you'll understand what I'm saying. Stewardship is more than tithe and offerings. So I'm going to assume that we understand those other things that come before, before I will move on to the specifics uh, of a tithe uh, today. Now this is new stuff, but, but I'm trying to put this out as a way of answering some of your old questions about tithe in Scripture. The word tithe, again in the circular, tithe simply means a tenth. And I put up on the screen the Hebrew word where the word tithe comes from, simply means a tenth. There was a tithing system in the Old Testament. And that's where we read of a second tithe and a third tithe. But we're not going to go there right now. Simply to make a reference, there was a tithing system uh, in the Old Testament for God's people. But included in the tithing system was the first tithe. Now when you read the literature, you will see this terminology. First tithe. The Lord's tithe, the Levitical tithe, all of these three labels are speaking of the same thing. Whether it is the first tithe, the Lord's tithe, or the Levitical tithe, it is speaking specifically of what that we turn to God as tithe in the singular. Now, also included in the tithing system, Old Testament we're referring to, is a tithe specifically to support the poor, the homeless, and the widows, the orphans. Now, this is a time that sometimes uh, is referred to, for example, in Deuteronomy as another tithe or another 10%. It's interesting when we're looking at the book of Malachi, that Malachi makes reference to both the Levitical tithe, the Lord's tithe, or the first tithe, in addition to other tithes. And I'm going to show you scripture as to how both of these concepts are expressed in the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, which Adventists, of course, love to visit, you'll see tithing, as a matter of a religious obligation. In other words, when you're part of the people of God, whether it was Israel or the church today, tithing is part of our life in the context of a worship. So it is a religious matter, but it is also expressed in the book of Malachi as a system that supports those that work uh, in the temple. We have the reference Levitical tithe. Now finally, ladies and gentlemen, young people, in case you might miss it, the most important thing in the book of Malachi is not tithe or offerings, even though they are stated explicitly. The overriding emphasis of Malachi was a call to return to God, to come back to God and hear that call in Malachi chapter 3, return to me and I will return uh, to you. Let me 
me point out how the Levitical time of the first five is mentioned in another kind, but you also see other times by just simply looking at the text that you see on the screen. So you see in the in the English Bible, second line, tithes in the plural. But then when you go down to verse 10, the reference is to tithe. Again, I've already alluded to the fact that both the Levit Levitical tithe in the first time is mentioned, but you also have other tithes mentioned at the same time. Let me talk to you about the second tithe. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I've quickly provided for you some information that may answer some of your questions before I get into the specifics of time. Number one, the Bible does not teach a second time. It doesn't. It makes reference to another time. And again, if you've been following what I've said already, uh, there, there, there's tithing, there's a tithing system where you have the Levitical time and other times. But the Bible does not say anything at all about the second time. However, in terms of our Adventist tradition, Ellen White talks about a second time. But what is important when you look at the context, when you look at the context, this was not a reference to the Lord's time. But this is a reference to offerings to support the special projects uh, that she was uh, talking about. Now, I need to be very honest with you as, as far as the church is concerned. There was a time that we as a church, because of our focus on mission, did promote a second time. We were looking for all kinds of ways to increase our financial resources. Even though it was not biblical. Interestingly, if you go down to the website of the General Conference, Stewardship Ministries, you will find the reference that I'm going to put up on the screen for you at the bottom. And, and basically what I'm trying to convey to you is this, today, as a church today, we only talk of tithe in the singular, the first 10% of our income and offerings. Now very often people will ask me, but what about someone who is convicted about putting in a second time? My position, and I think this is the position of the church, if that is your practice, if you are comfortable with that practice, then that's fine. Where I think we get into problems when we try to impose that practice on other people. And so you see the, the position of the church at the bottom of the screen, and I think you can read it for yourself. Applying the second time principle to the system of offerings may not be the best solution for increasing the offerings received at the local church level. Ladies and gentlemen, I will simply provide for you some extra information uh, that hopefully will answer some of your questions. But let me now focus on the teaching of scripture about time. Now, I can quote you with all kinds of biblical references, but I don't think that will help us in, in terms of trying to know exactly what does the Bible teach about tithing. But I want to take you to this passage. It's Leviticus 27. Now, by the way, let me give you a, a, a bonus, an extra. I know that, that the reason why you're here is because you are committed to God and you're committed to the church. And I want to affirm you uh, for that. Now, as members of the church, let me give you four chapters of the Bible. If you really want to have an appreciation for financial stewardship, here are the four chapters that you need to read and, and be familiar with as a Seventh-day Adventist. Are you ready? Four chapters. From the Old Testament, Leviticus 22. I will come back and talk about it. Every Seventh-day Adventist ought to be familiar with these passages of Scripture. Four chapters. Two from the Old Testament, Leviticus 22. Second passage, Leviticus 27. Of course, we can look at a lot of other chapters, but I'm saying for your learning, focus on those two, where we talk specifically, or the Bible talks specifically about tithe 
and our feet. So let me repeat Leviticus 22 and Leviticus 27. Let me take you to the New Testament. Two chapters that you ought to know and be familiar with. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you read just those four chapters, ladies and gentlemen, your experience in stewardship will be enriched enormously, enormously. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 are loaded there full uh, of stewardship messages. But let me take you to this particular chapter. This is Leviticus 27. I also want you to focus on the label at the bottom of the screen. Here's a simple way of trying to understand what is tithe. Tithe is a specific quantity of the whole. The key word there is quantity. Tithe is a fixed percentage. It is a specific quantity of the whole. Now you've got the text on the screen. You can check it out when you go home. But I want to take you to verse 32. That's where you find the principle. Now you need to understand that we're talking about subsistence farming, agricultural communities. And so the illustration or the picture is appropriate for that context. But I don't want you to get lost in trying to count the animals. I want you to get the principle. So here is verse 32. Every tenth animal, every tenth tree, fish, or whatever the case may be, look for the principle. Every tenth of the whole belongs to God. That's the fundamental principle of tithing. It's the first 10% that belongs to God. Now, some of you may have heard me talk about the story of this retired physician uh, from Botswana, Gaborone where I had the privilege of actually being in her farm and literally counting the animals. Now that's a practice of course that we find here in Levit Leviticus. Every tenth animal belongs to the Lord. So I, I remember uh, when I was at her farm in the Kalahari. Remember going to different places where the workers early in the morning brought in the animals. And I remember sitting on the fence and they would bring the animals and I would count in English. Then when I come to the tenth animal, instead of me saying ten, I would say tithe. Then of course, we would continue until that lot in that particular place was done and then we had to travel to another place. Now by the way, these were not all the animals, these were just the increase. These were the calves. These were the animals that were born this year. This is a reference to the increase of tithing. It's not a reference to the whole. It is a reference to the increase. The equivalent of that would be your cash flow, your income in a cash society. Now you remember what I said to you earlier. Tithe is an expression of God's love for us. Now how do we know that? Let me give you this illustration. Out of the ten, in God's mercy, He said, You keep the nine units of the whole. You keep it because I love you. But in order to build our relationship, in order to build your trust in me, all that I require from you is one ten. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we don't call that tithes. It's called tithe in the singular, the first 10%. The Lord's tithe, the first tithe, or the Levitical tithe, it's the same thing. Again, what's the point? What's the underlying value when it comes to tithing? This is God's system whereby He wants us 
to trust him. It's about trust, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, think about it. If God is the creator of the universe, then God owns everything. The psalmist talks about uh, cattle on a thousand hills. We can go to other parts of scripture where the Bible makes it very clear all of the, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, everything belongs to God. So this is not a God who is short of cash, who needs help from us. Tithing is a way to exercise your faith and a trust uh, in God. Let me put up on the screen and this is where you can use your camera and grab this particular slide. Everything that you need to know about tithe and offerings is on this one slide. But I want you to focus on the column to the left under tithe. Let me go through line by line to help you understand what the Bible teaches using just this one slide for us today. We've already made reference to the book of Leviticus where the principle of a tenth was clearly expressed. But you also saw in that same text the reference that time belongs to God. Now let me tell you what the implication of that for us today. If time belongs to God, then listen to the way we talk or the way we do it. We don't pay time. To pay time is to assume that the money is yours. The, the, the theoretically correct way of expressing our returning, our giving of time is the return of time because it belongs to God. So we need to get used to the term return. We return time. We never pay time. Number two, time is holy to God. Again, scripture is very clear on that. Holy simply means that this is something that God has set aside for himself. Time is holy. It's earmarked by God. 100% of the time it belongs to him. I want you not to use your pen. I want you to write three things. You don't have it on the slide, but three things that God specifies about time. Three things. In the English language, all of these three things start with the letter P. Number one, God specifies the percentage of time. The word is percentage. Now talk to me. What's the percentage of time? 10%. You got it. So it is God who determines the 10%, not us, not the church. It is determined by the owner. So he said, you keep nine units, but you return one unit to me. That's the time. Number two, God specifies the place where time is to be returned to. What's the word? Place. Now talk to me, what's the name of the place in the Bible? The storehouse. I don't have the time to explain to you the concept of the storehouse. But the storehouse were physical rooms in the temple and Jerusalem. They were part of the temple structure and these were rooms where the Lord's tithe was stored and dispersed. Now I can refer you to a couple of documents if you want to read some more about this place, the storehouse for the church right now. So here are the two references for, for your further study. There's a compilation of Ellen White's statements of the storehouse by Dr. Edward Reed. Ed Reed. That document is called In Search of the Storehouse. You will find it very helpful. In fact, you can probably find it just, just Google, go online. It might take you to the General Conference uh, Stewardship website or the North American Division. You may be able to download that document again. In Search of the Storehouse, author Ed Reed. There's also a chapter, uh, a chapter from a book that you're familiar with, Stewardship Rules. But there's a 
documented by Dr. Angel Rodriguez, former director of the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference. And, and the title of that document, Tithing in the New Testament. Again, I am providing you those references because we don't have the time to talk about the, the storehouse. But I want to bring you now to the present. On the basis of biblical principles and on the basis of the writings of Alan White, here we now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a temple on earth today. But the Seventh-day Adventists, on the basis of Scripture and the writings of Alan White, have designated, hear me on this one, the local conference as the storehouse. What is the storehouse of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? The local conference or the local conference treasury. Now let, let me come back to where I started. The specification or the determination of the storehouse is something that belongs to God. I, as the believer, don't make that determination. God has made that already. So three things that God has determined. Number one, talk to me, the percentage. Number two, the place, who determines that place? Us? God. God determines where to return uh, his the time to. Number three, the people to be supported with time. What's the word? People. Now in, in, in the Old Testament, these people were, number one, they were a whole tribe, whole tribe of Levi. Which is why sometimes the Lord's tithe is referred to as the Levitical time, because it was to be used specifically for the Levites. And by the way, Levites were not just men. Levi was a whole tribe, it included women and children, the whole tribe of Levi. They were to be supported uh, with tithe. There were others that were supported with tithe, and those were the people who served in the sanctuary. These were the priests. Now what we need to understand, as I have shared with you earlier, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that it was God who determines tithe in these three areas because He is the owner. The owner is making a call, number one, how much percentage, number two, where to return it to, the storehouse or the local conference, and number three, who to benefit uh, from time. I can go through very quickly on the rest of those other uh, pointers about time. It's an act of worship. It's a spiritual response. It's an expression of our loyalty. Now that's very important. Loyalty to the covenant relationship that you have with God. Let me remind you that there was a time in your journey when you said yes to Christ, when you said yes to the church. Do you remember that time? It's called your baptism. And by the way, in the baptismal vow, one of the statements in the baptismal vow is a statement about your conviction and your pledge of faithfulness to the returning of time. So that's the reference. It's an expression of our loyalty or faithfulness. And then finally, this connects with the third P that we've talked about. Tithe is never to be used for the building of infrastructure. Now I know for some of you who serve in administration of conferences, unions, or divisions, you know that the church makes provision for evangelism, but primarily, Time is used to support gospel workers. Probably about 90% of that is retained in the local conference to do that. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, everything that you need to know about time you see there uh, on the left part uh, of the screen. I'll come back to what's on the right in the next presentation. Let me give to you very quickly the way we practice as Seventh-day Adventists. Time. Make the point is 10% of our income or our cash flow. Free will offerings, I'm going to talk about that uh, a little later in another presentation that will compress. Again, there's a standard measure of giving, but I will leave that uh, until we look at offerings specifically. 
What is interesting for us at this point in time is to recognize when it comes to financial stewardship, not only God expects us to return the tithe, He expects us to give up offers of gratitude, but every one of us must also make provision for the needs of our community and the local church, and we simply call that together uh, charity and project uh, giving. Let me move now to the end of this particular presentation. Seventh-day Adventists are very obsessed with the book of Malachi. And part of that obsession, it comes from our appreciation of the promise that you find in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Now, on the surface, there, there, there seems to be a, a dilemma. And the dilemma comes because there are some Bible versions in English where they talk about the windows of heaven. But then you also have other versions of the Bible that talks about floodgates of heaven. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's a theoretical exercise or an academic exercise. But here's my position as, as I look at the text. Both are correct. And I'm simply putting up on the screen why those two different imagery are necessary in conveying to us uh, the blessings uh, of God. But let me run now with the promise of God opening up the floodgates uh, of heaven. Let me take you to my message to Lesotho 2017. I remember on the Sunday I was taken for a tour uh, of this particular dam, the Mohammed Dam. Now while I enjoyed the tour, my eyes were also looking for some, some pictures, some illustrations uh, of tithing. This is where I found these pictures that I took myself to be very helpful. So I'm taking a picture of the lake, if you may, the dam. Now here are some pictures that I got from the, uh, from the web, but I want to really illustrate for you why the concept of the floodgate is powerful if we understand this clearly from scripture. Now I'm, I'm taking a picture of the dam towards my left, but on my left you will see some openings. Now this is what we call the floodgates. So when the dam is full, and to make sure that the pressure from the water will not damage the dam, this is where the outlet, the floodgates will come into play. So imagine that the water is rising, and then finally it will move to the floodgates, and this is where water is poured down to the valley. I am down from the bottom of the valley looking up, and I'm taking this picture, just trying to give you a feel. The, the floodgates are huge. Bigger than the windows. Point here, this is about the capacity of God. God has the capacity to pour out His blessings. That there will be no room for us going to Scripture to contain His blessings. Here's the promise that very often we go to, and again I'm using the NIV, picking up on the imagery of the flood gates. God is faithful. Now if you're able to see the screen, I'm going to ask you, read together with me before I get to my appeal on this particular presentation. If you're able to see it, otherwise you can read from your Bible, it's Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. I am looking at the NIV. Let's read together everybody. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in these, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be room enough to store it. Let me finish with some personal testimonies. How many of you use the Colgate toothpaste to help you with taking care of uh, your mouth and, and your teeth? Now did you know, and by the way I put up some details on the screen, did you know that William Colgate, that's his real name, he was a tithe payer or someone who returned tithe. It's interesting when you look at his biography that he 
was introduced to the topic at the age of 16. Started his soap business at the age of 19. Bankrupt. And yet he was still faithful in the returning of time. Started with 10%. Now, by the way, William Colgate was not a Seventh-day Adventist. But he believed in tithing. He believed in tithing. When he died, he was returning 50% of his income. 50%. When he died, he was one of the richest person in the city of New York. So one day, people came to him and said, Sir, you're doing very well in business. What's your formula to success? Why are you doing so well? William Conkate, and I've got it in both letters to the bottom of the slide, said this. I practice tithing. But then he said, tithing is like I spoon something in. Now, it's an in interesting kind of a comparison. A spoon and a shovel. But using that imagery, or imagery, he said, tithing is like I spoon in. I only put one unit of the whole. But in return, God shovel out. Do you get the picture, ladies and gentlemen? We are talking of the flood gate. God is faithful. I'm going to finish with my own testimony. You know, I'm a second generation Adventist pastor. I'm a PK. As I reflected on my own spiritual journey, as I reflected on what God has done for me, as I think of where God has led me, I can only think of my parents' faithfulness. Now when you read scripture, God makes the promise, when you're faithful to me, not only will I bless you, but I will bless the next generation and the next generation. The very fact that you're able to see me here today is a testimony to the faithfulness of God. Like William Colgate, in tithing we spoon in, but God shovel out. Now the real question is, ladies and gentlemen, would you like to experience the shovel? Would you like to experience the floodgates? God is faithful. Let me pray for you, and then we'll change the files. Our Father, we thank you for your church who are coming in together today. Because they love you, and they want to be obedient to you in the area of stewardship. Father, we have heard your word. We have looked at scripture, and it's very clear to us that part of being saved by Jesus Christ is to be faithful to that covenant by returning to you what belongs to you. We also thank you for the promise of the floodgates. And Father, I pray that you will demonstrate your faithfulness to your people because you love us. And there are people here that are going through some difficult times in their lives, whether it has to do with their family, it has to do with their work, but it has to do with, with the church. But we want to claim your promise that when we return to you in terms of our total self, you will be able to bless us abundantly. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make a call right now as we pray. If it's your desire that you want, number one, you want to be faithful to God in the area of time. You want to be faithful to God and you want God to give you the strength to trust Him. I want you to raise your hand right now. I want you to raise your hand. By raising your hand, you say, yes, I believe in God, I trust God, and I know that He will provide for me. I just want to raise your hand and, and keep it up. Funny, ladies and gentlemen, if you had doubts in the past that God is able to deliver, able to heal, able to bless, able to multiply your resources, but today you sense you can see clearly that this, this is where God wants you to be. And you 
want to claim that promise and say, yes, I am ready for your blessings for me and my family. If it's your desire that you want to be showered, you want to be blessed with the resources of God, the blessings of God, promise to us, I want you to raise your hand. Again, number one, you just want to say, Lord, I want to be faithful to you. Number two, I want to experience the blessings of God. Raise your hand, ladies and gentlemen, and let me pray. Father, as we demonstrate our trust in you right now, for our businesses, for our families, for our children, and for our churches, Father, do it to us. May we experience your faithfulness this coming week. For we ask you all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord.